Let the brightest light of Diwali illuminate your mind. Enlighten your hearts and strengthen the bonds between people. Let this festival of lights bring prosperity and healthier lives. Let's share our joy of life with sweets and celebrate together in the spirit of this festival. Baba ne Diwali ki bahut bahut shubhkamnaye aur badhaiya. Shubh Deepavali ki hardik shubhkamnaye. Allarakum Deepavali asham sab. Me too Mariam me too me sabhi London ki Deepavali shubhakanchi. Sariyan hum Diwali diya lakh lakh badhaiya. Koi sari ki Diwali hum sekha mubara. Ne vyallari ko Deepavali aur shubhashe galu. Amma tarupro apna mana ko Deepavali ra shubhkamna. सबनिंग के मिंजे तरफा डायरी दी लख लख वादाइया उंगले तो उंगले तो मत नल तो इने दीपावली नलवाई तो Let the brightest light of Diwali illuminate your mind. Enlighten your hearts and strengthen the bonds between people. Let this festival of lights bring prosperity and healthier lives. Let's share our joy of life with sweets and celebrate together in the spirit of this festival. Sabha ne Diwali ki bahut bahut shubhkamnaye aur badhaiya. Shubh Deepavali ki hardik shubhkamnaye. Allarakum Deepavali asham sab. Me too Mariam me too me sabhi London ki Deepavali shubhakanchi. Sariyan hum Diwali diya lakh lakh badhaiya. कोई सारी की दिवाली हुन सेठा मुबारक ने वियल्लारी को दीपावली और शुभाशय गलो आमो तरफ रो आपनो मन को दीपावली रो शुभ कामना सबनिंग के मिंजे तरफा डायरी जी लख लख वादाइया उंगले को उंगले को मत नाइ को इने दीपावली नलवाई कर the stage is yours please look like sara skin sir do you mam sir me mam yeah very honest ah sir yeah, yes ma'am sir rashma sir yeah, yes ma'am yes, i can hear you but the music yeah no no music and all we are stopped ma'am music okay yeah we have stopped we have stopped right now ah, okay. now it got stopped no it's still playing sir now no, no, it now, got now i have stopped ma'am anita ma'am ah yes sir stop ah, ma'am yes sir yeah yes 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 now yes okay then yeah okay then yeah please take care buffering ma'am buffering okay शुभम शुभम या गुड आफ्टरनून सर Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, everyone is audible. You can please start the meeting. Aruna, ma'am, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Please Arna start the meeting, ma'am. Sir is also there. Ah, yes, sir. Okay. Ma'am, can we start? Yeah, Arna, start, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm starting it. Yeah, happy afternoon to one and all here. Yes, ma'am. You can start, please. On behalf of School please. of Computing, SRM ISD, and uh, my own behalf, I welcome you 
all for the guest uh, i welcome a guest speaker dr r ramanujam sir and i extend a warm welcome to dr shridhar sir audit professor formal language and automata theory overall course coordinator dr saranya ma'am course coordinator of ctech nwc sintel and dsbs departments and all the faculty members and students for the guest lecture on a modern look at automata theory i am very happy to introduce our renowned speaker of the today's session dr ramanujam got his b honors in electrical and electronics engineering from bits pilani and his phd in computer science from tata institute of fundamental research mumbai after post doctoral research at city university of new york he was at the institute of Math mathematical science chennai until he retired in july 2021 Currently, he is visiting professor at Assam Premji University, Bangalore, and Peking University, Beijing. His research interests are in mathematical logic and theory of computation, and their applications to theory of distributed systems, game theory, and security theory. He is currently on the editorial board of ACM Transactions on Computational Logic. In 2010, he was a Lawrence Fellow of Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bazinar. Dr. Ramanujam has been associated with Tamil Nadu Science Forum, and he is editor of Tulip, a monthly magazine, a science magazine for children. He was a member of Yashpal Committee that formulated the National Curriculum Framework 2005 and chaired the National Focus Group on Teaching of Mathematics (NCERT). Currently, he is the president of Mathematics Teachers Association of India and is on educational committees of ACM India and the Association for Symbolic Logics. He also chairs the Enum Enum Eritu Mission set up by the Tamil Nadu government to achieve fundamental literacy and numeracy for all children by 2025. Dr. Uh, R. Ramanujam was awarded the 2020 Indira Gandhi Award for Science Popularization by Indian National Science Academy. We are very happy to have you here, sir. Should I start? Sir, we invite you to start the session, sir. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, you can start speaking. Sir. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Vijaya. Thanks, Professor Arun, for the kind introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to talk to uh, students of uh, SRM. Now. Uh, can I have a look at some of the audience, please? Can I see somebody at all? I'm seeing only myself. Uh, can you please add people on the panel? Uh, yeah. So. Excuse me. I, I can you remove me from the panel? Can you add some people so that I don't want to see myself, but. Uh, I'll start sharing screen. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible? Are you able to hear me? Uh, can somebody respond, please? Uh, no, not on yeah, chat. You know, visible, sir. If Yeah, I would like to look at some people when I talk, please. I have made this request many times. I do not want to talk to my laptop. Uh, yeah, can I have a couple of videos on so I can talk to somebody? Otherwise, right now the only video on is myself, and uh, yeah, that's much better. Thank you, Doctor Arna. Thanks. I can at least uh, see something. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to. The title I have given is theory of computation: a modern look. Uh, now, this is a bit, uh, you know, what is modern about automata theory, right? So, I want to start with a question. 
So here is a quote. Okay. So these I, I mean these are words that I considered worth listening to. Um, so let me read the quote. We should explain before proceeding that it is not our object to consider this program with reference to the actual arrangement of the data on the variables on the engine, but simply as an abstract question of the nature and number of the operations required to be performed during its complete solution. Does anyone have any idea who wrote this? This is not modern English. This is old English. Any guess on who this might be? Um, yeah, this is why I wanted students. So I want somebody no, no. to. Do you have any idea about who wrote this? Anyone would like to make a guess? OK. So this is Ada Augusta Byron King, Countess of Loveless. Ada Loveless, the world's first programmer. This is, uh, you know, she's describing Charles Babbage's uh, analytical engine actually the differential engine. And she's saying that, you know, when you look at the program, which, you know, is working on this, it is not about the arrangement of the data on the variables of the engine, right? But simply as an abstract question of the nature and number of operations required to be performed during its complete solution. I don't know when anybody here last wrote a program to solve a differential equation. This is not an easy program to write. And that is what Ada was writing in 1843 on a non-existent computer. This was not a laptop. This was not a, you know, and it is a machine. It was not even uh, built. It was an abstract machine, mechanical one entirely. But she was solving a differential equation on that. And she's trying to tell you that it is not your declarations and the code that you write that is important. Of course, you need to do that. That's how you solve the problem. But that it is an abstract question of the nature and number of operations required. Now, you hear about this in algorithms, right? When you talk about counting number of operations and so on. Ada is talking about this from 1843. So this is one of the fundamental reasons to look at computing as not just something that you do work with devices with, but as an actually an abstract question. Okay. So here is another quote. This is Rudy Rucker, who says, we are presently in the midst of a third intellectual revolution. The first came with Newton, where we learned that the planets obey physical laws. The second came with Darwin, biology obeys genetic laws. And today's third revolution, we are coming to realize that even minds and societies emerge from interacting laws that can be regarded as computation. Everything is computation, says Rudy Rucker. Now, whether you agree with Rudy Rucker or not, you should think about this because what is going on here? You are saying that, uh, you know, you are in the world of social media, right? You're all the time hooked on to social media. You are on WhatsApp, you're on this, you are connected on the internet. So the society that you are considering is a society of minds, right? And it is all connected through computation. Now, and so, in fact, Rudy Rucker is telling you that everything that's going on actually is computation because your documents are all on the cloud. Everything that you do, you, you know, when I'm talking right now, I'm using StreamYard and I'm using some PDF. And it's all computers that are connecting and showing you something, right? It's actually computation that is the meaning of almost, you know, at the heart of almost everything you do. Even a, a farmer, you know, uh, doing his agriculture uses, you know, the phone today, right? And not as a phone, but actually as a communicating device, actually sharing documents, all sorts of things are going on, right? So everything that's going on can be regarded as computation. Well, so I have some questions. Why should we study theory of computation at all? I mean, the title of the course was mentioned as formal languages and automata theory. This is what we used to call it 30 years ago. And that's how the subject began. But if you look at what's happening today, the formal language theory part of it has really, you know, faded into the background. Automata theory, theory of computation has become central. And, but why should we study theory of computation? About Turing machines, finite state automata, pushdown automata, all this stuff. 
somebody should ask Dr. Vijaya, why did you make me study theory of computation? Right? Uh, students have a right to ask that question, and they should ask. Then she says, oh, but it's a very important thing. It is fundamental. It is fundamental to computer science. OK, it's fundamental. Next question is, why should I study theory of computation? OK, it's all important. It's all this thing. Let Dr. Aruna study it. Why should I study? Right? I want to do some web page creation, and I want to do some apps. Right? So why should we study theory of computation? I think these are important questions to ask. These are answers that you're not going to find in textbooks. Right? Textbooks don't tell you. You know, textbook says, OK, you've come to study. This is how you study. I give you the text. It's up to you. right? But why should I study? And look, what if you are having a theory of computation course, what can we reasonably expect from somebody who is sincerely following the course to really learn? What are the takeaway things that you can expect to get from a theory of computation course? What can a teacher expect the student to learn? Right? So, I'm not, I'm not going to answer each of these, but I hope at the end of the lecture, we have some idea of what, how we may want to answer these questions. And I hope to convince you, after all, I'm here to sell automata theory to you. I hope to convince you that it's actually a meaningful exercise. It is something that you would want to do. Right? Unfortunately, I also agree with many students on this. The books are written in a very boring way. A lot of books are written in a way, unless you are mathematically motivated, it doesn't excite you. But there is a lot of exciting stuff going on. So here is another question. Is computer science really a science? Right? Now, you're getting a degree in computer science and engineering, right? Uh, or something related. We use in the term computer science all the time. But is it really a science? Now, again, I would, uh, you know, at this stage, usually I ask students to, you know, go over their experience of learning science, right? Uh, in school, you learn science. What is specific about science that is different from any other discipline that you learn? What is unique to science? Uh, would anybody have want to say? Okay. Yeah. Somebody wants me to clarify question two. But yeah, as I said, yeah. So would anybody like to say what is, is computer science a science? Yes, sir. But why? I mean, why is it a science? In science, when you learn science, what is unique to science? Not rules. Rules are there in all. Mathematics is all about rules. Proofs. Any other comment? Why is it a science? What is unique to science? Anyone? Well, the notion of experiments. Uh, right? Sir, it follows the laws of nature. Laws of nature. Well, it is about understanding the laws of nature, you can say. But it is about nature. Right. It is about understand, studying physical, uh, uh, you know, reality in some sense. But most importantly, if I come and tell you that, you know, um, everybody at rest or in a state of uniform motion continues to be in that state until an external force is applied, well, computer science is a science of identifying patterns and relationships, says I have found. Okay. I, I understand that. But uh, my point was that if I'm going to call it uh, science at all, right? where is the notion of experimentation in computer science? And computers are about computers and machines. Where is nature in this? Yeah. In fact, social media creates artificial worlds for you. OK. So one thing you can say is that it's clear that a computer is a machine, right? <clears throat> so but I've never heard of uh, a degree called, uh, you know, Lathe science. Lathe is a beautiful machine. I like the lathe very much. It's one of the most versatile machines that I have seen. But I've never heard a degree called lathe science. Right? I've never heard of any other. Only computer science we talk about. <coughs> well, suppose you can have something like a machine science. 
what are the elements of any machine science if you talk about identifying patterns and relationships i will say that is what mathematics is all about in fact to me algebra is all about understanding patterns and relationships and uh, but computer science is something more it is providing a kind of machine science right so what would be yeah is the are, what are the elements of any machine science this is my question here is a machine that i like very much okay and that is a pressure cooker okay and we have it all it's a good machine right we all have it in our homes and in fact our kitchens will be extremely poor if you didn't have a pressure cooker right in fact uh, probably the single most thing that happened to indian women in the 1960s and 70s was pressure cooker right the time and energy was suddenly liberated to do other things a beautiful machine now suppose what would be the elements of a pressure cooker science i claim that in fact you know forget this machine or that machine any machine you can talk about machine science so here is my proposal for a pressure cooker science okay so for this what i'm going to do is stop sharing right now and i'm going to move over to my blackboard at this point okay yeah okay. just give me a moment i'll set it up uh, So I'm going to share screen. Yeah. Okay. And now here, present share screen. Are you all able to see my blackboard screen? Can you? Um, no. Whoever is on the control panel, I think uh, you have to add my. There is. I can see it. It's on the show. But Panel. Yeah, yeah. I no. think uh, you have to add my. There is. I can see it. It's on. My second screen, one which has my camera, but the other one. Ah, yes. So okay, you can see it now, right? Now, yes. So please tell me when I write whether you can see it as well. Are you able to see? Yes. Anyone? No, sir. No. No. We are not able to see. Okay. Let me just check. Yes, screen sharing. Uh, okay. okay, so maybe I'll try. Okay, so let's look at it this way. Are you able to see a circle? No, so we are able to see the blackboard, but yes. not what writing. Not any of the writing on it. Yes. Okay. Let me open a new one. Yeah. What about now? Oh, it's not moving, is it? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. So, yeah, this is a bit of a disaster. Try. Ah, that is because the two application sharing screen are not letting each other interfere. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm sorry about this. It's not the moment it uh, 
Okay. Let me stop uh, and present my go back to PDF. Yeah, I'm afraid uh, this is a problem with uh, StreamYard. Yeah. StreamYard doesn't allow multiple things to be open at the same time. Yeah. Sorry about that. So I can't use the Blackboard. So let me just uh, talk you through this construction. OK. So um, now, here is a question that we ask. Once I have got a pressure cooker, right? what do I use it for? To cook things, right? Now, can somebody tell me which takes longer to cook, rice or dal? Dal. Dal, OK. Um, how, which dal. takes longer to cook, rice or vegetables? Uh, depending on the vegetable. Depends on the vegetable. Exactly. <laughs> right. Now, let's say that I am talking about potatoes, right? Uh, or, or whichever, some green vegetable, right? Um, or fish. That's, the, you know, uh, I don't know whether anybody has here has fish. Fish is very fast, right? To cook. Yeah, fish. Now, uh, the point is this. Yeah. There is a certain classification. You say that rice is easier to cook than dal, and uh, dal is easier to cook than probably some red meat or something, right? Now, suppose instead of this pressure cooker, I have got some super duper uh, microwave or infrared or something like that, right? Somebody is coming and selling to you, here is this new technology, things cook very fast. Now, will it, will, on that new machine that I'm buying, on the new cooker that I'm buying, which will take longer to cook rice or dal? Okay. This is the point. It will still be dal will take longer to cook than rice. Instead of, yes, this is the point, right? Instead of uh, maybe in the pressure cooker, rice takes five minutes and dal takes 10 minutes. In the new super duper machine, rice may take only one minute and dal may take 1.5 minutes. But that's the difference in technology. It doesn't matter which machine you use. Dal will always take longer than rice. Why is that? Because it's a property of rice and dal. It is not a property of the cooker at all. Do you see this? Fine. This is one point to me. Second point is, this is an important point for pressure cooker science. Second point in pressure cooker science are there things that you cannot cook using pressure cooker? Uh, Do you have anything that you can't cook using pressure cooker? Anyone? Yeah, it is there, sir. Milk. We cannot boil milk using pressure cooker. What about metal? <laughs> Metal, certainly you can. I mean, ladies finger. Okay. I, I, I would debate with you on that. Right? But right. metal, metal, cannot, I mean, the whole reason why you are putting something, you know, rice in a patram and putting it into a pressure cooker, because the vessel doesn't cook. If the vessel starts getting cooked, you have a problem. Right? So, what is going on here? What you are studying is not the pressure cooker at all. Do you see what you are studying? You are using it as a tool. Pressure cooker is now a tool in your hand to go around looking at things in the world, classifying them as things that can be cooked and those that cannot be cooked. Among the things that can be cooked, things that can be cooked easily, things that are hard to cook. How hard to cook? How easy to cook? Classification is at the heart of science. Living, non-living, solid, liquid, gas right stone you know uh, plant plant kingdom animal kingdom etc etc right classification is how science starts laws come much 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 later please understand that similarly and what is very important here is that a pressure cooker when you say pressure cooker science what you study is not the pressure cooker but a tool pressure cooker is a tool to go around looking at the whole world Science always gives you a way of looking at nature at work, at the world. Pressure cooker science is a particular science where you go around classifying things as, you know, uncookable, cookable, 
you know, easy to cook, harder to cook, etc. And that is exactly what you do with computer science. Computer science is not the study of computers. What are you going around looking at? Not vegetables, not metal, not solid, but problems. It's a tool. You go around looking at the world of problems. You say, using this tool, which problems can be solved? You categorize the problems as unsolvable and solvable. Computable, incomputable. And then you say, among those that are solvable, among those that are computable, you classify them as these are easy, these are difficult. This is easier than this, right? Like you say, and the point is, you want to do it in a technology independent fashion. This is very important. I would underline this. When you say science, you mean in a technology independent fashion. When I say dal takes longer than rice to cook, it is not about the particular prestige cooker or Hawkins cooker that I am saying. It is not about whether I'm using microwave or infrared, right? Sorting takes n log n time. It will take n log n time, whichever kind of computers that I use. It doesn't matter whether it is my laptop or some super duper supercomputer that somebody is using. I want a technology independent way of classifying. So what are you studying? Problems in the world. You classify them. So, and you build these hierarchies. That hierarchy is what we call complexity, right? Things that take exponential time, things that take polynomial time, things that take n log n time, things that take linear time, things that take log logarithmic time or space, whatever. So this is one paradigm. There is another paradigm. There is another way of looking at the pressure cooker. You can say, ha, huh, look at the pressure cooker. What I do, how does it actually work? It doesn't matter whether I'm putting rice or dal. Does the pressure cooker know whether you're putting dal into it? No, of course it doesn't know. Does it know whether you're putting chicken into it? No idea. All it does is, well, you close it tight. You put on a weight and then you apply heat. What happens inside? Hopefully you put water in it. Water converts to steam and therefore pressure builds up inside the cooker. At some point, it lifts the lid and releases steam. And then what happens? The pressure comes down. So this can be described using a differential equation, right? And this process that I have described once again, has absolutely nothing to do with whether you're putting dal or rice. Or. And once again, it has nothing to do with whether you're using Hawkins cooker or, you know, prestige cooker or whatever somebody puts out into the market. It is about the nature of how cooking is done. It is the very process of what you call cooking. What is the process of cooking? I mean, you can't cook something that has no water in it. Remember that your finger gets cooked because there's a lot of water in your finger. Like, you know, it really blobs up, you can see. It is the process of converting the water content. That's why metal doesn't cook, because it has no water in it, right? So anything that is water can be cooked, because it is the process of converting water into steam and thereby releasing a pressure that you call cooking, right? Similarly, you can look inside the computer, right, and say, I don't care about whether the computer is solving, you know, not about rice or dal. It is not about whether you are working on uh, Google or Zoom or, you know, computing the value of pi up to 1 million decimal places. It doesn't matter. I just want to see what are the different states that the machine goes through. It's a machine. It has certain states. It has certain transitions. And I understand the state changes in it. The state changes, like I said, in the case of the cooker, pressure building up, releasing, and that I describe for all time by a differential equation. Here I can describe by a mathematical process. That's exactly what we call theory of computation. Theory of computation is a way. So these are the two important paradigms in computer science. One is the paradigm of algorithms and complexity, where you use the computer as a tool to go around classifying things in the world. What you study is not the computer but problems the world that you are looking at is the space of problems you categorize them the second paradigm is that of theory of computation which is a technology independent description of what goes on inside the computer 
without worrying about which input, which output, and so on. It's some abstract way of saying this is all that happens inside the machine, and I want to describe it mathematically. And uh, therefore, I would say, in fact, not it's not just a science; it is not just a machine science. In fact, it is the mother of all machines, right? I mean, that is the uh, there is, in fact, a technical sense in theory of computation which tells you that, in fact, the computer is the mother of all machines of some kind. And that we call the church during thesis, which says that anything that can be physically realized on any physical machine can be simulated on a digital computer. Okay, so we need not worry about that for the moment. It is so the question is now from algorithms as abstract entities, we want to move to machines that actually enact the algorithm. And this is why we want an abstract theory of machines. Why do you want an abstract theory of machines? Because remember, I want to make a statement that you know this is easy to do or this is difficult to do. Not because I find it easy. Not because you find it difficult. It's not because I am stupid and you are intelligent. right? Like I said, sorting you know, takes longer than uh, finding maximum. Yeah? But I want to say it in a technology independent fashion and i want to say it now or ever right it doesn't matter whether you are talking about in 2022 i can say with complete confidence that in the year 80 you know forget 2022 in the year 2074 in the year 22074 it doesn't matter anytime i mean we don't know whether humanity will exist because we are all capable of destroying each other but supposing we actually are there and some students who are looking at it, it doesn't matter. Sorting will st still take a log in time. Some things will be easier, some things will be harder. Because these are mathematical statements. That's the point we want to say. That somewhere we want to move away from these platforms. And I can't, you know, uh, overemphasize this point for computer science students. Because this is very important. And I'm sure, uh, you know, Dr. Vijaya or... Aruna is much younger, but you know, will agree with me. In the last 25 years that I started computing, you know, learning computing from to today, computers have changed completely. This is not, I didn't learn computers from the kind of computers that you guys are looking at. I started in Bich Pilani in late 70s. I have seen punch card machines and I have seen tape machines and I have actually carried hard disks like this, right? You know, huge hard disk taking, you know, so much weight and having 512k and i remember i was so proud of it you know uh, having 68 megabytes right and today on a usb you carry like gigabytes and don't think twice about it right so things have changed my point is for all computer science students platforms will change technology will change that is for sure 20 years from now, you're not going to be using these kind of computers. You're not going to be using this kind of platform. What will not change are the foundations, right? What will not change is the underlying abstraction. If you learn a particular programming language, C++ went. You know, it was a big deal 20 years ago. Today, nobody cares about it, right? Z minus minus will come, right? But the principles of programming languages will not change. Right? And that is why I am saying theory of computation carries, theory of computation will remain exactly as it was today, you know, 20 years from now. So I deliberately gave a title as modern look at automata theory to point out that it is by giving again and again another look at what we already know, the foundations, that you see contemporary research. But it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the foundations will change at all. The foundations have to be, once they are strong, once you understand. So this is the main reason why we study theory of computation and computing, because theory of computation and algorithms represent the core of our understanding that is completely technology independent, right? Hold on to that. Whatever else changes in the world, these are things, similarly principles of programming languages, as opposed to learning a particular programming language, right? Once you understand the principles of programming languages, it doesn't matter. Today it is Python, tomorrow it will be Panther. Who cares? Right? You can master it in three days.
But if you are entirely tied to one platform, one programming language, one this thing, it's very hard. When that becomes obsolete, you can also become obsolete, right? So this is why. So we want an abstract theory of machines. In fact, the simplest model of a machine is what is called a reactor system. What is a reactor system? It just sits there. Somebody gives some input or stimulus and response to it. Why am I looking at this as our machine, not an algorithm? Uh, many students, if I ask what is mathematically what a computer is doing, they say an algorithm. Makes a lot of sense. You think of it, computer is sitting there, some input comes, you process it, produce an output. You give an input input of stream of things, you sort it and output it, that makes sense as an algorithm. But then what is the algorithm computed by Zoom? <laughs> right? What is the problem that is solved by StreamYard? Firefox operating system. In fact, if you look at almost all the software that you use all the time, whether it's WhatsApp, right? what problem, what's an algorithm there? Is it solving a problem? It's not solving any problem. Actually, it is what I call a reactor system. These are systems that are there and wait for input. I mean, operating system is a classic example of, uh, right? So it takes some input or stimulus and responds to it. And uh, in fact, this is what are called state transition systems. And this is the oldest model coming from the natural sciences. Physicists describe all world as state, state transition systems. You don't care what system you're talking about. It doesn't matter whether you're describing Firefox or uh, operating system or Zoom or WhatsApp or any of that. It's a system. It is in one of possible, several possible states. Any input or stimulus that you give causes a change of state, right? This is all that you're talking about. And what is the desirable behavior of the system? Well, basically, I want to say that OK, is the system do, working correctly? Well, it's in a good state. It's not working correctly. It's in a bad state. So I want to partition the set of states into two kinds, right? Good states, bad states. That's all. And then you can say that, OK, it's you want to start when you boot the system. When you start the system, it should start from some, some designated state. Because if it starts in an unfamiliar state, you have a problem, right? You want the first initial state, the boot program, to work correctly, right? This is very, very sacred to all operating systems, right? All browsers, doesn't matter, right? When you start, switch on that thing, it should start in some reasonable state, a good state that you can understand. After that, whatever may happen, it will depend on the input. The initial state should not depend on any input, right? Because you are ready to receive inputs and response. Now, you see that we already have a mathematical model on hand. We, we can write describe a system as a tuple, which has a set of states, set of possible states, and set of possible inputs that it is willing to take a look at. And then you have a transition, transition map, which says that if you are, you know, you it's a map from a pair. Why is it a pair? Well, if you are in a state Q. And you are looking at a particular input in sigma, then it says what is the resulting state. Yeah. So this this thing says that my the effects of my transitions can be computed. Right? I am at so Q naught is some initial state and some set of good states that you have identified. Right? This is it. This is a state transition system. And this is enough to describe almost every bit of software that you can look at, right? Except that one important thing, I have not said anything about Q is the set of possible states. Yeah, then at this point you start saying, ah, but what are the possible states of my browser? What are the possible states of my operating system? What are the possible states of my WhatsApp app, right? Yeah. So. Well, that depends on how you want to describe your system. It is what you want to study. It is, remember, if I have a program that has three variables, right, x, y, and z, 
let's say that x is boolean it's going to be either 0 or 1 y is an integer right and z is a name right okay now x can have only two possible values so one state is when x is equal to 0 or x equal to 1 y is an integer but it can take infinitely many possible values so x equal to 0 y equal to 5 and z equals around is one state x equal to 0 y equals to 22 and z equal shubham is another state right set of possible states is simply described by saying what are the possible what are all the possible values that my variables can take that's all when somebody says q is the set of possible states i am just giving name maybe i have five variables maybe i have 22 variables maybe i have 1000 variables it doesn't matter once you say for each variable again i have also declared possible values right so among the value space variable 1 having a particular value v1 x1 equals v1 x2 equals v2 and so on up to xn equals yn is one state keep listing all the possible you get all the possible states now this may be finite it may be infinite and the theory of computation is entirely about studying state transition systems where the set of possible states is finite or state transition systems where the set of possible values or set of possible states is infinite the first lot we call finite state automata the second lot we call turing machines that's all actually all the rest don't worry about it turing machine having a head and tape and all that it's all nonsense i mean every, it's all absorbed in this. you only need to understand state transition systems but it's very very critical whether the set of states that you are describing is finite or infinite why we'll see in a moment but this is basically how you get into theory of computer. At this point, there is something very surprising. We said state transition system. We didn't say a one word about the outputs. What about outputs of the system? Well, I mean, there's no problem. You can add another set gamma of possible. I mean, I said sigma of possible inputs. Why not gamma of possible outputs? Of course, I can add that. And then uh, I can have a map which also tells me uh, if I'm at a state, it's a map from the set of states to set of outputs. It says you can specify what outputs the system gives depending on its state. Right? It says that if I'm in state Q0, I'm outputting A. Right? If I'm in state Q1 or Q2, I'll output B. So I take an input, move to a new state, and produce a new output. You can always do that. But it turns out that for reactor systems, almost all the reactor systems that you study, it doesn't matter at all. Um, in fact, all you need to do is uh, you can study the behavior of the system simply by seeing how it reacts to inputs in terms of the state change. It's something that you can code up. So don't worry about it. All you need is the model that I mentioned earlier, which is this. This is all that you need to look at. As I said, this is all that matters because you want to study state changes. Like I said, in the case of the pressure cooker, pressure building up, pressure going down, et cetera, et cetera. That's all that you care, right? And uh, all you need is to uh, be able to describe state changes. And that is very important, of course. Okay. And... Uh, so the okay. So uh, yeah, input output behavior can always be split into input, state change, and output. And from the state change, you can always see the new output because your map is anyway from here. So you don't need to worry about outputs at all. We only want to say how the system reacts to inputs. So okay, now. We are going to have a problem because I'm used to doing this on the board and I'm not able to connect to the board. So I will just describe this 
and hopefully i hope you will take it up as an exercise and do it now how do you understand system design is to do actually do it right so suppose you want to design a vending machine right that gives a cup of tea for 2 rupees right um and uh, it can take 1 rupee coins and it takes 2 rupee coins okay i said we have to say number of states you know set of states set of inputs and i say transitions how do we study its behavior right now well let's start with the set of inputs what are the going to be the set of inputs for this machine anyone one and two one and two one and two okay let me call it r1 r2 for you know some symbols representing rupee 1 rupee 2 but is that enough is that enough think of a vending machine that you have if you have seen a vending machine at all for instance vending machine that has uh, i don't know chips packets some things right you put coins does it as soon as you put a coin does it start doing something you have to press a button saying give me tea right this is very important because when i put money right it's not clear whether i want something immediately or maybe i want two cups of tea right we don't know okay so it's better to build it into your system design so i would say my set of inputs has three elements one element r1 for 1 rupee coin r2 for 2 rupee coins and t right let's say t to say give me t right now comes the question okay what are the possible states of the system three states okay what are the states yeah what are so the three states state, the one where we take one one and the final state where we take one more one on from the initial state directly to the final state where we take the input as two very good okay now see the thing is this that okay so let me call those three states as 0 1 2 <laughs> what is the meaning of the state 0 meaning of the state zero is that i haven't got any money in it right okay so at this state zero the money that you have given me is so far is zero the state one stands for the money you have given me is state you know is 1 rupee state two represents the money you have given me which is 2 rupees okay very good now at state zero what are the inputs that are enabled well i can if i am in state 0 that means you have not given me any money so i can take an input r1 well what is the new state well i am in state 0 you have given me r1 so the natural new state is 1 very clear well if i am in state 0 i can also take a 2 rupee coin right fine so i take a 2 rupee coin and i move to the state 2 Which is also okay. What about what if you press T in my state zero? Remember, nothing stops from somebody who is walking by to chumma press the button saying T. What should the machine do? What is the resulting state? It will cycle over the initial state itself. Okay, you say that it can be a self loop on zero. If I press T, I remain in state 0 doing nothing well now here comes principles of system design right at this stage this is not about you know computers automata it is about what you call system design right now most system designers will say that if the machine anticipates something and something different comes you should tell the user such a thing right so one standard thing at this point is to say that i mean there is nothing wrong with having a self loop let me make it very clear there is nothing wrong at all but one is to have add a fourth state to say an error state 
So you have not just three states, 0, 1, and 2, a fourth state, which we call E. So that at 0, if you press T, <coughs> you are at an error state. And implicitly, error state, you are outputting maybe a red symbol, something flash, right? And you actually press reset. Very often, it will say reset. And on re in an error state, the only input that it will take is reset, in which case you go back to 0. Otherwise, you keep looping in that error state. This is one. Now, I have no particular uh, reason to decide which are which. I'm saying this has to do with your principles of system design, your behavior that you would like to see in the machine. That is what designing machines is about, right? Constructing automata is very important because it is an expression of your understanding of system design, right? So you don't say, oh, the easiest thing for me to do is the self loops or I'll do it. That's lazy, right? You want to do not what is the easiest thing for you to do, but what is the correct thing to do? Let me go on. Okay. So that takes care of state zero. Now, what about state one? Of course, R1 is enabled and you move to state two. But what about two rupee coin at this point? You are in state one. And now somebody wants to put a two rupee coin. Do you want to accept it or not? Anyone? Uh, I should be allowed. It should be allowed to be accepted. But anyway, one rupee has to be returned back. I need to have an option. <laughs> OK. So this is again a word system design, right? At this point, as far as what we have been told about vending machine is that there is no reason to decide either way, right? Remember, when you are building a machine, you, somebody has given you the contract, right? Somebody has asked you to build it. You go back to that person and say, boss, what do you want at this point? One way is to say, you must return the machine, uh, return the money. But in fact, most manufacturers will tell you, no, why not have a new state called three? Take the money. You, because you were lazy and having only three states, zero, one, two, you are refusing to take this, right? I have no problem. Go to a new state called three, right? Okay, that takes care of the input. Now, in state one, if somebody presses T, the same thing like we are argued in zero. Either you can have a self loop or you go into an error state. Now you go to R2, I mean the state two. In state two, we have already got a new state called 3, right? So R1 will take me to 3, no problem. If I press T, it will take me back to 0. That's also no problem. Now, if I press R2, right? If I'm putting a 2 rupee coin, what's your problem? Take it. So if you think about this, what are the set of possible states of the machine? To me, the most natural answer is the set of natural numbers whole numbers, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, who cares? At the level of abstraction that we are thinking about, why? who are you? Why are you putting any constraint on this? The number n is a state of the machine. n means so far you have put in n rupees into the machine, right? What are the transitions from n? At If you give me r1, it goes to n plus 1. If you give me R2, it goes to N plus 2. If you press T, it goes to N minus 2. If N was greater than or equal to 2. If N was less than 2, it will uh, go to an error state. That's it. What are the good states? Every state except the error state is a good state. Because it's all good behavior. Do you understand the point I'm making? Yeah. Now. This is the abstract way of thinking about it. Now you say, hey, but come on, a physical machine can hold only so many coins, right? In the state, you have only kept track of how much money is coming in because you are greedy, right? You want to get as much money into the machine as possible. But supposing I tell you that only 50 coins can be held in the receptacle. Now, my notion of state is no longer simply the amount of money that is there in the system. 
but n comma counter let me call it c n comma c right where c is the number of coins in the receptacle so in the initial state it's zero zero there is no money there is no coin when i put r1 i go to one one because i've got one coin when i put r2 i go to two one because the amount of money that i've got is two rupees but i've got only one coin yeah and so on now let's say 50 coins with 50 coins what is the maximum amount of money you can have can somebody tell me 100 rupees right so you have all possible pairs from 00, zero to 150 right now it's a finite set of states and you have all the transitions and uh, now what happens when you're supposing you've got let's say it is possible for you to have uh, uh, i think uh, yeah, 50 coins, but not 100 rupees, right? It doesn't matter what the amount of money. So supposing you are at a state where it is n comma 50. That means n is the amount of money you've got so far and the coin tank is full. Now what should you do? At this point, R1 is not enabled. R2 is not enabled. You press, R, you know, you put a coin or whatever, it will refuse to accept. It will go to the error state, right? Until you empty the coin. That's it. You have a description of the system. Notice that now all kinds of behaviors are possible. For instance, I can have uh, R1, R1, R1 10 times and then press T, T, T five times. No problem. Yeah. Because you can have 10 one rupee coins going in and then you ask for five cups of tea. No problem. What about T to the 5 followed by R1 to the 10? Is that okay? What do people think? Should I allow a behavior like T to the 5 followed by R1 to the 10? So the question I'm asking, is it okay for us to keep pressing T five times? And then followed by that, press put 10 one rupee coins. Right. If we are talking about the vending machine, no, we won't be allowed okay. that. Well, it actually depends on whether you are the buyer or the seller, right? Yeah, that is it. Yeah, I mean, if you are the buyer, you don't care. If you are a seller, you damn well care because, you know, what if the guy, you know, goes away without actually paying the money later? Yeah. So, well, this is really why I'm saying it is when you are designing the machine, your job is to basically talk to the person who wants a specification and work out what is the precise specification that you want. So the best way to describe it is by sequences. Some sequences are okay. Some sequences are not okay. Right? The sequence R1, is it okay? What about the sequence just, just R1, R1, R1? Or maybe R1 to the 50. Is this okay? Anybody? Do you understand the question? Yeah. The sequence given is just R1 to the 50. Some 50, 100 rupee coins, somebody's put. Nobody is demanding T, nobody is demanding anything else. Is this okay? I mean, that's fine from the seller's point of view. <laughs> Precisely. Right? So, we are not here to decide any of these things. Right? As a scientist, it's not your problem. Your problem, you as a machine designer, you don't decide these kind of things. Like invariably, I find students immediately saying, no, no, this should be there. No, it's not our job. Your job is to design the machine according to the specification. Look at the specification. The machine that you are designing is an implementation of the required specification. Somebody gives you the specification and then you ask, am I implementing that specification? Right? Does my machine behave in a way that satisfies the specification? So we have no control over the person who is demanding the machine. So the best way is to say, ah, I don't know which sequences are OK, which sequences are not OK. You come and tell me, boss. Right? 
I look at the set of all sequences. What is sigma for us? The input R1, R2, T. I am willing to look at any finite sequence over R1, R2, T. You tell me whether they are acceptable or they are not acceptable. So you give me a subset of the set of all possible sequences over sigma, partition them as acceptable sequences, sequences to be rejected. So we call it L subset of sigma star. The notion of a language in automata theory is a specification. Please understand that. Language has nothing to do with speech. It's nothing to do with this. I mean, it comes from formal language theory for different reasons. Ignore that. The best way to understand it is a specification. Someone who is asking you to design the machine gives you the specification. And remember that that person is God. You can't question why this sequence should be in L, but not this one is not in L. That is some reason why the person wants it, right? It's not our problem. My question is, okay, you have given me the specification. That specification, if you look at your textbooks, it will be written in English or Malayalam or whatever language. It's a natural language, right? You say all sequences where two A's are followed by a B, where every A is followed by a B, but not C and so on and so forth, right? I don't care. But somebody gives you a clear way of saying, if I keep enumerating the sequences, this is a tick, this is bad. This is acceptable, this is not acceptable. That's all, right? So somebody gives me L subset of sigma star, and I have to design a machine that shows that behavior. So this is the principal idea in machine design. Sequences of inputs provide a convenient tool for studying behavior. Now, first observation is very important. Every finite, I should say finite sequence, every finite sequence of inputs leads to a unique state. Why is that? I start with an initial state Q0. The first element of your input is A0. Delta, the transition function will tell me if you are in state Q0, on A0, what do you go to? Maybe Q22. Okay. Now you take the input A2, A1, or whatever, right? The next input. Transition function will tell you from Q22, if you get A, what is the new? Maybe there is Q37 and so on. So you arrive at a unique state. And now you say, if that state is good, okay, you consider the sequence of inputs from the environment suitable or acceptable for the system. So as far as the machine is concerned, you give me a sequence of inputs. If that sequence, I apply my machine. If the resulting state is a good state, I say, the sequence is OK for me, for the machine, right? So otherwise, the environment behavior that you have shown me, remember that the sequence is always the environment behavior, right? What does that mean? When I write R1, R2, R1, T, T, I have in mind a user who first put a 1 rupee coin, then a 2 rupee coin, then a 1 rupee coin, and is asking for 2 cups of tea. So it is the user behavior that I'm describing, right? So some things, some user behaviors are acceptable. Some user behaviors are to be rejected, unacceptable from the machine's point of view. And remember, this is something normally forgotten. It, you have no control over the environment. User behaves in some particular way. It is the system that is accepting or rejecting some behaviors as okay or not. So now we have got two kinds of notions. One is that the contractor or whoever is your employer, who is saying, I am putting tick marks, right? Some sequences are okay, some sequences are bad. So the employer is telling, is giving you a specification L subset of Sigma star. Your machine has uh, a notion of which sequences that are accepted are rejected. You say that your system matches the specification when what you call OK is exactly what your employer calls OK. And whatever is not OK there is rejected. That's all. So the two things that you are understanding are machines and their behavior and the notion of language 
and then you say this language is accepted by this machine this language is rejected by this machine so and that's basically the heart of automata theory right i'm sorry that i couldn't use the board to actually work around and do the you know things with this particular example there is a lot to see but the important definition here is that there are two sides the machine has its own notion of acceptance or rejection and on the right hand side for the language an element a, a sequence belongs to it or not this is what your you know person employing you is telling you okay or not when you say that the language of the machine is contained in l what you are saying is that whatever is considered acceptable behavior by the system is considered okay by the one employing me it belongs to it conversely l contained in lfm says that if some string actually belongs to l that is specified as it should be okay my system actually accepts it right so when you learn automata theory you are often asked to do these proofs you are asked to you know given a machine you are asked to show that this machine accepts exactly this language or you are given a language and you are asked to construct a machine that accepts that language the meaning of this exercise is for system design l the language is somebody who is employing you is going to give you that is a specification what you are constructing is a machine now it's your burden of proof to show that my constructed machine implements exactly that specification no more no less that is the equality that you prove and the equality has two directions language of the machine is contained in l l contained in language of the machine right now Uh, this is basically at the heart of automata theory and uh, we usually have uh, uh, okay um, attendance is going on is it really people are saying presence no? okay uh, yeah now there is something interesting another element that comes in. exactly like i said you know that coins receptacle can hold only so many coins right what about tea i talk as if there is unlimited quantities of tea in the machine right actually there is a being a physical machine it will have only so many cups of tea right then you can say that ah but i can keep one more counter my state is not a pair My state is a triple. N comma C C is the number of coins that are present, and then number of cups of tea, right? Let me call it some M, which is present in the system. So every time you supply tea, that number keeps going down, and then you hit zero. And but there is another way of thinking about it. At the level of description, I don't care, right? When there is so much money, and you press T. one of two things can possibly happen either you get your cup of tea or the machine shows you know a flashing light orange light and it says a hey, refill replenish in this in the tank so that you know it gives a beep it's possible so at that point it goes to this error kind of state and it says you know refill refill, refill until you refill and then it goes back now here what we are trying to say is that if my machine is in a particular state on the, seeing the input the new state is not completely determined it is one of two possible states so the machine is in state 22 right 22 rupees it has got credit somebody presses t maybe it will give t and go back to 20 or non deterministically it goes to another state where it actually says you know refill refill the tank the receptacle containing tea yeah this is the power of non determinism 
non determinism does not mean that the machine has some free will and it is deciding right i am on state s on a it can go to s1 or s2 it doesn't mean that the machine is exercising some choice no it says at the level of description i i have got so far i cannot tell whether the resulting state will be s1 or s2 that's all it's an abstraction that is employed and this is very important for automata theory and non determinism is very very important and because it provides a level of abstraction for system design when i am designing the machine i don't want to care about number of cups of tea in the machine number of coins the token count you know uh, receptacle can hold any of these things i just say non deterministically it will move to one of these and there is a fundamental theorem of automata theory that tells you if there are only finitely many states you can always eliminate non determinism by exactly like i said by keeping a counter on the number of coins that you want a counter for number of cups of tea you can eliminate all that and make it deterministic and that's a beautiful mathematical statement that says that this is not for this particular example boss any example it doesn't matter as long as you've got only finitely many states like i told you the ref computation is divided into two parts state transition systems where the set of states is finite state transition systems where set of states is infinite this matters nothing else matters so here we are now talking about set of states being finite if you are building a machine that can hold only finitely many coins can give only finitely many cups of tea don't worry all it does is to read input and produces keeps producing output then non determinism can always be eliminated then why do you have non deterministic automata at all because they provide a level of abstraction that's extremely important for system design right so you can start describing your systems at abstract levels with small number of states a small automata and keep adding descriptions and building bigger and bigger systems this is called system refinement and today this is how you study automata theory you study as as you know small automata that are very abstract and then you refine it you go to larger automata your behaviors get more refined and you go on and you build tools to do the job you don't do this by hand you do this using tools so the final system design may have you know hundreds of states you know thousands of transitions all that now but then you start with some very simple design and go on with it this is the philosophy and for this non determinism is extremely important and the second thing that you use is this very important notion of robustness so what is regular behavior it is just a umbrella term to talk about behavior of any machine that is finite state i don't care whether it's a vending machine or a xerox machine or i don't care traffic lights i don't care anything that has got only finitely many states what do i mean by robustness in the tuple that i define i said you have a set of states a set of inputs right a transition function and initial state robustness says you can change everything else hold on to the finite set of states that's all that matters what do i mean by this it means that for instance set of inputs i said that's a finite set of inputs actually you can make it an infinite set of inputs it doesn't matter right the set of behaviors will continue to be the same i said transition function says if you are at a particular state q reading a you go to a new state q prime we have already seen that you can make it non deterministic it doesn't matter you know theorem which says that class class is accepted as the same right non deterministic has the same power as deterministic well i can do more i can say that the machine is in a state even without looking at input spontaneously decide suddenly to go to a new state we call it epsilon transition doesn't matter the class of behaviors is the same okay and so on in fact what you can say is that ha ah, but if the machine is in state q and you give me state input a 
with probability half it will go to q1 with probability half it will go to q2 or maybe with probability one third it will go to q1 probability two thirds it will go to q2 doesn't matter right the class of behaviors the class of languages accepted is the class of regular languages okay so this is one of the central learnings of automata theory that and then we said what are the uh, how do you accept uh, a string well i start the machine from the initial state run the string through look at the resulting state if that is a good state i accept it. can i change that notion of course you can change that notion let's say that uh, i said one initial state ah, but have multiple initial states it doesn't matter i say that well i take the graph of that machine and then if there is a path from one of the initial states to one of the final states accept that's good or i say accept all those sequences which take me from one of the initial states to one of the final states and you must come back to one of the initial states doesn't matter class of behavior is the same or you say that you can start with one of the initial states you must visit one of these states in between and then reach one of the final states doesn't matter one one more thing for instance you say that you can start with one of the initial states and you must end with one of the good states but you must avoid some particular state all through okay so the class of finite state automata is robust in the sense that you can change all these things and i was saying r1 r2 t assuming that r1 comes first then r then let's say r1 r1 t right But that i means i am reading input left to right what if i am arabic i start from right to left right ah who cares right these are called two way automata you don't care whether you read it left to right or right to left or, or both right so pretty much everything is negotiable that's why finite state automata capture pretty much any finite state system you encounter it doesn't matter whether yeah it's not the, and that is one of the reasons why automata are hugely applicable right like i said you can talk about regulation of traffic lights you can talk about satellite navigation it doesn't matter you can always present it as state transition system and you can use tools that manipulate automata to implement specifications which come from a wide variety of things the next thing that you learn is that you can also optimize these things ah so it's not just about uh the fact that you can set up a relation between languages and machines finite state machines which you call regular languages and finite state machines but you can also ask for the specification you have given me how best can i design the machine how efficient is my machine construction so one can ask what is the minimal machine that accepts the given behavior right and that is the notion of optimization and so and there are beautiful you know theorems that tell you that give you give me any regular language i can always build not just the machine but i can actually construct the minimal machine there is in fact an algorithm that tells me what is the optimal machine for this language yeah and uh, well minimizing deterministic finite state automata is very easy but if you are given a non deterministic machine minimizing it is difficult right because your minimization is not only with respect to the number of states but also possible transition maybe i can build a very small non deterministic automaton which has a lot of non determinism can i bound the degree of non determinism etc etc leads you to very interesting questions and what is very nice is that for analyzing your implementations there are all kinds of algorithms that are available that is why you look at algorithms for i mean what are the kind of algorithmic questions you can ask okay if here is uh, a machine some non deterministic machine does it accept a string at all 
does it accept a sequence at all? That's a yes or no question for which there is an algorithm. But there is a reasonably good algorithm for answering this question. Is there any string that is accepted at all? Or if this string is accepted, will that also be accepted? You can ask all kinds of questions. And what is very nice is that for the class of finite state machines, uh, there is there are efficient algorithms for many natural questions, which are implemented in tools. And usually in theory of computation, you study a few of these algorithms. And because you get some insight into how you might actually build algorithms of this kind. Uh, then there is, uh, OK, another very important thing is that theory of computation has this running theme of duality between programs and machines, right? This hardware, software, we talk about hardware, software, code design, and so on. The days when I started learning computer science, hardware was very distinct from software. Uh, nowadays, no longer so. Uh, nowadays, uh, whatever you realize in hardware, you can pretty much realize in software. And many things, in fact, if you look at hardware programming languages, they're also pretty abstract. You can do a lot. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand what I'm saying. If you study computer architecture in detail, you see the truth of what I'm saying. But in theory of computation, this is already fundamental. The notion of programs and machines is actually dual to each other. That means what? This is this idea of equivalence of machines and programs. The kind of programs that you talk about in theory of computation are called regular expressions. This is a small programming language that you are taught. It has, well, basic statements. What does your programming language need to have? Right? You need to be able to say, you know, put value 3 into variable v. Right? You want to assign values to variables. Right? But we already saw that a state is the description of values of variables. Right? So if you Somebody is uh, doing something. I don't know. Okay. The one moment. Let me just yeah. Shut down. Ah. So once you have uh, values of variables, any assignment of a value to a variable is basically a state change. That's all. So you don't need to worry about if you have only finitely many states, there are only finitely many assignments that you can do, right? So you don't have to worry about describing them. You just call them A1, A2, AM, right? M can be any number that you want, right? And uh, so that's OK. You just have to look at finite set of uh, inputs, and then you can continue, yeah? So that's all you've got. and then. You want to say that, uh, well, I need to write, I mean, fundamental operation is sequencing in a programming language. First do this, then do the next. Okay, And then you want to have if then else. And then you want to have while do or repetition. That's it. You have a programming language on hand. In regular expressions, instead of if then else, you put in as choice. Right? You know, either do R or R prime, R1 or R. And then you have iteration, R star, which stands for uh, while do or repeat until low. Yeah. So the, the main point I'm trying to make is that you can either describe computation as a machine, or you can describe it as a program in a programming language. And a fundamental theorem tells you that these two are the same thing. Uh, are you able to hear me? So we are able to hear you. But, uh... Uh, this thing is frozen, I think. Can you give me one minute? I will yes. uh, redo. Yeah, just give me one minute. I have to leave sure. the studio. Sure.
Yeah. Uh, sir, anything to share, sir? The slides, everything. That's all right, sir. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know why suddenly my system is acting up. No, no, no. Okay. Share screen. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to see the screen? Um, yeah. Is it okay now? Yes. Okay. So, equivalence of machines and programs is a very important and running theme in automata theory. And uh, you, Sorry, just hold on. Yeah. Sometimes suddenly these things uh, freeze for no reason at all. Uh, <clears throat> is it coming on? Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, so this is also unified by an algebraic notion of equivalence. And this is because <clears throat> you want some way, some machine independent way of characterizing regular languages, regular behaviors. And this is what is achieved by saying that it's exactly all those uh, languages that are described by an equivalence relation of finite index, the so-called Mahilnerod theorem. Uh, now, this is very important mathematically speaking because it's a notion that has nothing to do with machines or programs. It's simply a mathematical statement. And uh, what you're saying is that there is a right invariance relation which is simply defined by the algebraic structure of what you have got. And anything that is describable, definable by finite index is actually what is uh, regular or finite state. So, and uh, the other thing I said was, you know, you are not interested in just behaviors where you go from initial state to final state, 
but you may want to avoid some state in between. You might want to go. Then you might ask, like, okay, what kind of sequences that cannot be accepted? Okay, we can say that all language is definable in a suitable logic. There is a theorem which you don't study usually in theory of computation, which is the monadic second order logic of sequences, is exactly what is accepted by regular languages. So the these two statements that I'm saying are important for theoretical understanding because this is independent of your notion of state transition system. It is independent of your notion of programming languages. And <clears throat> theory of computation, you want such statements. This is what gives you the guarantee that whatever I'm saying will hold not today, will hold in the not in the 21st century, but in the 42nd century as well. Right? It will hold not only with the kind of computers you've got today, but maybe quantum computers, you know, DNA computers, I don't care, right? Because I want them to be mathematical statements independent of the very notion of automata and programming languages. That you're talking about. So these theorems are very important for that reason. But if you're not that much worried about the mathematical foundations of these things, this, this latter part is not critical, but this is absolutely critical. Because this part, that realization in hardware or realization in state transition systems is the same as writing programs in programming languages. It's a fundamental insight in theory of computation. And this is something that you need to carry in your head throughout. Okay. So, in fact, you can generalize. You can go to a theory of regular anything. And this is the this is where we move to what I would call current research. Right? I want to also give you an idea in the remaining little time of how you build, lift automata theory to things that are really 21st century research. Let me call it 21st century research, because what I'm talking about is research from the last, roughly in the last 20 years or so. <clears throat> Who says that? You must look describe behavior only using sequences. Yeah. The only kind of behaviors we have talked about are finite sequences. R1, R2, T, R2, etc. Right? But who says? Why not infinite sequences? Does the theory change? Well, your input is not just a sequence, but for instance, a tree. Why would I look at trees as... Uh, inputs. Well, suppose I am interested in XML. I don't know if you guys know um, HTML or XML or any of these things, right? I want to accept or reject documents, right? What I am building is a web browser, right? What does a web browser do? It goes to URLs and keeps harvesting things, right? And it wants to accept certain documents, reject certain documents based on some criteria. So the language is not a subset of sigma star anymore. It's not a subset of sequences. It's a subset of documents. How are documents, HTML documents given? As trees. If you think about it, all XML documents, they are all trees. In fact, elements in databases typically are trees. Trees are most natural representations of, you know, or you can think of programs as parse trees. So trees figure everywhere. If you don't know what I'm saying about databases, don't worry about it. Take my word for it that uh, you know XML documents, for instance, can be represented as trees. Right? So you want an automaton that runs on trees. Right? Inputs can be pictures. You know, my web browser is actually, you know, doing processing of images, processing of pictures. In fact, you can have a theory of picture languages, right? So I'm really no longer interested in set of finite sequences over sigma, and then L is a subset of that. No, I'm interested in the class of pictures, and L is a subset of picture. My language, my automaton looks at a picture, accepts it or rejects it. And you know, it will look at some part of the picture, move to a new state, looks at another part of the picture, moves to a new state. This is exactly how you do pattern recognition. In fact, Whole lot of image processing can be done that way. Beautiful applications exist. Inputs can be DNA sequences. The sequences, I said, you know, 
with our kuti example was uh, r1t r2t r2 etc etc right but think of sequences like att cc ta gg ca tt and so on they are dna sequences right now can i build an automaton that uh, describes a virus okay it's a beautiful question if you think about it right because a virus is a self replicating organism it requires a host in fact whole lot of uh, things that you look at is by looking at rna processing and dna processing i don't have time to go into it you know somebody likes molecular computation that's a beautiful you know uh, thing to study um, in 1992 leonard edelman of the same person as rsa fame stunned the world by actually building a dna computer to do to solve one particular problem and what was the idea well you know that dna are all you know um, dna is you know the structure of dna right as a double helix right now at a certain temperatures these things break up into single strands right so in any given a uh, bunch of molecules that you have got you have lots of single strands and then you combine them but when you combine them uh, you actually move to different states right you actually get state transition you can think of navigating an entire sequence in some particular way and build organisms so i don't have time to go into it but my point is that you can start with this and build a beautiful theory of mo molecular computation right now it's only a beautiful theory with nice examples people have actually constructed good things whether you can build general computers of this kind i don't know i think i am very uh, eager to see maybe not in my lifetime but i am very sure that students sitting here they'll probably see you know molecular computers for sure because it's a matter of technology and what is very clear is that as far as the science goes you know these things are doable right what is stopping us that is that we don't have enough molecular machinery but today if there is one field that is expanding in a dramatic way it is biotechnology right so my suspicion is in a matter of 10 20 years a uh, whole lot of the barriers will you know break down and you will actually be able to build computers general purpose computers using at least bio molecules i don't know about other molecules inputs can be infinite sequences right and perhaps this is the most extensive application of automata theory today in hardware and software verification because if you think about hardware a piece of hardware it's a reactor system right a huge you know when i say a piece of hardware it's a circuit which may have you know typically 5 million components right because today we pack enormous amount of circuitry into small pieces of hardware does it matter but it has inputs which are lines which has got zeros and ones and it you know and all it does is you know behave hardware is no business uh, you know uh, it's not computing doing any algorithm right it's actually behaving right and uh, what is of interest is to make sure that for instance reset button is always on in fact one of the nightmares of hardware is that if your reset button doesn't work right you have a serious problem right uh, anything is okay except that control c should work right so there are uh, your specification will have various such things and this is the idea of verification you want automatic tools that actually verify whether that specification is being met and uh, or if you look at the browsers if you look at operating system they are all reactive systems inputs are potentially infinite sequences they are not actual infinite sequences you say potentially infinite because your browser doesn't have any bound on the length of the inputs right a browser in principle as long as electricity is available it will go on forever right so you want to look at reactive systems of this kind a lot more reason to study infinite sequences i don't want to go into it but these are all very important areas of current research where automata theory is uh, if you want to say modern automata theory this is what we mean by automata theory where you can talk about not just regular languages of words of 
finite words, but you can take talk about regular languages of trees, you can talk about regular languages of graphs, regular language of partial orders. I mean, I have done some amount of work myself on these things. And uh, like I said, picture languages, DNA sequences, it doesn't matter. These are examples. So in fact, I gave a course of lectures called the theory of regular anything, basically to say that it doesn't matter. It's all mathematical structures. As long as you can code up such things, you can build automata theory based on that. Except that the automata that you build now may not be closed under complementation, may not be closed under Boolean operations, all the nice things that you study in your finite state automata theory part in your textbook. But that is what uh, life brings you, right? But you can construct automata. You can, the, the theme that I've been saying all along holds. What is that? You will have an equivalence of programs and machines. You can have regular expressions, tree regular expressions. You can have picture regular expressions. No problem, right? The operations will be slightly different, right? The algorithms for checking something, whether a particular picture is accepted or rejected, which class of pictures, ah, that's going to change. But you will have algorithms, right? The kind of robustness, non-deterministic one is the same as, has the same power as deterministic. All that will hold, right? So this is precisely why once your foundations are strong, you can go over to many different areas and you can navigate all of them beautifully. So tree automata is one thing where in database systems, you want uniform, efficient algorithms for processing tree, tree structured data. And basically you want to navigate nodes of trees satisfying certain conditions to check whether your SML tree has some required structure. And this is what tree automata are meant for. <clears throat> it's been studied uh, for nearly 40 years. But now, as I said, in the last 20 years, there has been a lot of developments on this. I mean, my own work in areas bordering database theory is mainly to see how automata theory and logic can be used extensively in areas of this kind. Now, I'm not going to continue more on this. I have a lot of stuff on uh, tree automata, but uh, let me skip all this. Point is that you can do minimization and you can do uh, the kind of correspondences between logic and languages, etc. <coughs> SQML is one thing where, I mean, SQL is one thing where all this is being done. So let me skip all this. Yeah, there are regular path expressions, tree walking automata logics for path expression. So all this, there has been like enormous amount of work in recent time. Uh, this is not to zap you with uh, jargon, but to point out that simply I have taken only the first few parts of your theory of computation, namely finite state automata, non-deterministic finite state automata. But my point is that once you get the point of it very strongly, you can actually, <coughs> I mean, areas like cryptography, I think, Introduction, it was mentioned that I work in security theory. In fact, all the work in security theory I do is all automata theory and logic, right? The tools are still this. And uh, <coughs> let me skip all this. Go to the end. Type checking, like I said, infinite state systems. Uh, data is used in verification. Yeah, so let me. <coughs> so, yeah, let's skip all this. Yeah, so I want to end with this remark about, I've already mentioned biologically inspired models of computing. Quantum computation can be studied exactly in the same way that we talked about finite state machines and infinite state machines. And uh, the notion of you know, take, looking at the world and classifying them that I said, all of these things work exactly the same way. Circuits as computation is again very important. Um, you don't have it in textbooks, but for modern look at automata theory, that's also, there is also this area called chaos based computation, which you don't generally hear about. This is about systems with nonlinear dynamics, um, which physicists study. And uh, you can talk about computation based on that as well. But Mathematics of all these things remain underlying the foundation remain exactly the same. So your standard theory of computation course by teaching you theory of 
non-deterministic and deterministic finite state automata and Turing machine gives you sufficient basis for getting into any of these areas. But these need to be really strong. That's the main point. I want to so why study theory of computation? It is about learning two skills that are crucial for all computer scientists. One is how to think about abstract computation, how to talk about abstract computation. And that's very important because concrete computation is what you do today. But the shape of that will change for sure. In 10 years, it will change enormously. But abstract computation will remain identical. So abstraction is the most crucial element of computation and thinking. And theory of computation teaches you the power of the finite state abstraction, how to analyze the limitations of your abstraction. This is one of the beautiful things theory of computation teaches you. The moment you learn regular languages, you also learn how to show that some language is not regular. You learn context-free languages, and you learn how to show a language is not context-free. You learn computable functions. You learn how to show some function is not computable, right? So there is a certain humility that is built into the theory, right? You always look at the limitations of your model. And I think this is a very important takeaway from theory of computation. I do certain abstraction, but I should be aware of the limitations of my abstraction. And most importantly, resource consciousness, which normally standard theory of computation doesn't take up, but you learn in complexity theory later on, where you say, you know, can I do this minim with minimal number of states? Can I do it in linear time? Can I do it in logarithmic time, logarithmic space, etc., etc. But, you know, for 21st century consciousness, I think resource consciousness is absolutely essential. So what does it mean for computer science students? Well, how do we understand computers without worrying about technology? What is the abstract relationship between computers and programs? With the omnipresence of computers and programs, we may think that every problem is solvable by computer. That is wrong, right? There are undecidable problems. Hardware will change, software will change, the models will not. That's it. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking such a long time. Um, uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Yes. What's your name, please? Uh, uh, my name is Syed, sir. I'm in my third yeah, year fine. of computer science. Oh, yeah. Science. I saw your comments. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, sir, I believe the best way to learn something is by building things and uh, uh, relating it to the real world. That is the idea I uh, uh, implemented in uh, data structures, uh, design and analysis of algorithms. But when it comes to theory of computation, the book seems very abstract to me, sir. So what <laughs> what are some of the things I can uh, build or like mini projects or uh, things yeah. I can build so that will give me a better understanding? So my reason for taking up uh, the vending machine as an example was simply to show that you can actually build things, right? I mean, after all, that was an exercise in system design of that kind, right? Uh, I would say that system design examples and system verification examples are probably the best, right? Okay. So uh, I think, like I said, uh, designing a traffic light system as a finite state of so, okay, designing a lift, right? People are, what are inputs? People are pressing different floors, right? You are at, at a stage, which you are somewhere. <clears throat> now there are two lifts. Which one should go down? Which one should go up? So you can design any number of such things, right? And typically starting from everyday life, if you start looking around, there are a whole lot of such systems. What is very interesting is first design, writing down the specification of the what are the behaviors that are acceptable? What are all the behaviors that are not acceptable? Right? And then you build a system, and then that system will have its own notion of good and bad behaviors and showing that they match, right? Is the job of the system design and verification. So I would say that's that's the and then you also learn to abstract out, you learn to see how much detail you should put into it, which details are irrelevant. So it teaches you that. And typically, you will also find that 
you need non-determinism. Otherwise, there is too much detail. So how do you use the power of non Thank you, sir. Yeah, master. Anything else, or? Uh, participants, if you have a, any queries, you can post in the chat. Sir, one query from my end. Yeah, uh, sure. So when we are trying to uh, teach this course for the students, so what do you think would be the best way to motivate them to uh, be doing it the right way? Yeah, so yeah, I don't have a one-line answer to this. But yes. uh, my main thing is to give some serious emphasis on automata construction. Right. I mean, like what uh, Sayed was uh, just mentioning, I think some system design examples are usually very good and not worry about whether it's finite state, infinite state, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Just do it and then abstract out to right with inputs, outputs, everything and then removing things and then look at the simplest possible design and then see how it behaves and then go on to uh, refining it. I think if we can bring in that methodology of analysis, it will help enormously to gain intuition. Yes, but and I think the main problem is that, yes, sir. Yeah, I think it's too formal. I think we need to be more informal with uh, more actual constructions and things. Get insight, and then you can formalize. Just yes, learning sir. it as a bunch of theorems, I think, uh, requires a lot of maturity uh, to understand. This is at least my personal opinion. Probably, as you said, the way we deliver the course will make a difference in uh, making I them understand as to why we are. I uh, think so. Yeah. And also linking it to algorithms and linking it to. Uh, yes, sir. And like I said, uh, also to even know that these are really abstractions of the actor system, like browsers or optical systems, etc. I think it helps. To see what okay. you are, why you are doing this. I mean, a Turing machine having an infinite tape is very bizarre, but actually, it's any extendable memory, right? And uh, you know, a finite tape is only an abstraction of whatever memory you have got. Rather than look at a very complicated memory system, I lay out all the cells in one sequence so that it's easy for me. That's all. And then the fact that it's unbounded tape which can be potentially infinite, it's only to say it's extensible memory. I can keep adding memory at runtime as much as I want. So it's simply a general model of architecture. So if people see the connection between actual architectures and the Turing machines are abstractions of all of these, I think it is. Yes, sir. Anyway, I think if it had been an offline session, it would have been uh, more useful for the students. More fun with yeah. Blackboard. I <laughs> yes, sir. We initially thought of doing that, and somehow, for some reason, we were not no, able but to. Make then it. I thought that, you know, for a large number of students, 
blackboard may not be visible. So that's why. But then uh, I know that StreamYard and this uh, link create some trouble. I've seen it in the past. That's why. Zoom, I have used it all the time. Even today morning, I had a class on Zoom. Yeah, initially we thought of having it in Zoom because of uh, the number of yeah. students. Then we were asked to move on to the live stream session. No, this is very good, except that uh, the Blackboard doesn't seem to work that well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So probably we'll uh, find a way out uh, before the next time we have live session. Sure. Okay. Anyway, uh, thanks a lot for taking up your time you and being much. with us to discuss about the topics. And I hope uh, to some extent, uh, it has, at least uh, I would say for me itself, it has given a, a little eye opener as to how I should be delivering the course to my students. And, uh, thanks a lot sir, for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. OK, bye, everybody. Bye. See you soon. Okay. Okay, sure. bye. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, can we close the session?